and welcome to this week's Wildlife Wednesday Weekly Roundup. I'm your host, Tenley Thompson, and we've got some amazing videos to show you from the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem this week. The way this is gonna work is we're gonna show you all the fantastic footage our guides have been taking on their trips throughout the week. Then you'll have a chance to win our trivia question of the week for a gift card to our EcoTour store. Lastly, I'll be answering your questions live. So if you or anybody else in your family, kids included, have a question for a wildlife biologist, naturalist, or somebody with a great knowledge of wildlife, the outdoors, and Jackson Hole, Wyoming, please start typing those in the comment section and I'll be happy to answer them at the end of the broadcast. I want to encourage everybody to remember that if you like and share this broadcast, we can spread our reach. And I'm also offering 10% off any future booked trip if you go ahead and give us a call and mention that you saw this Wildlife Wednesday broadcast in the next 24 hours. All right. Let's get started with the fun stuff. We had a pretty amazing view for the last four days of Grizzly Bear 791 in Yellowstone National Park. Let's check in. Most guests in our Yellowstone National Park trips this week had a really exciting sighting of a grizzly bear making use of an elk that he had killed along a riverbank in Yellowstone National Park. Most experts believe that this is Grizzly Bear 791, who is currently nine years old and is quite famous for taking down large, difficult to capture game. While we typically don't know as much about the life history of male grizzly bears like this large boar, we do know that this particular grizzly, if he is 791, was born in 2011 and didn't have a particularly exciting life from a human management perspective until 2014 when he was caught depredating cattle. The bear was relocated at that time to the Shoshone National Forest and has spent the rest of his time in Yellowstone National Park. In many ways, the story of 791 can be seen as a success story, where an animal who came in conflict with humans successfully was relocated and kept himself to wild foods thereafter. And 791 is a big, big bear, and that enables him to go after prey that is quite a bit larger than a grizzly bear would typically consider. Most grizzlies are going to target the weakest or most sickliest prey as the easiest option for food. Sometimes bull elk during the breeding season will display and fight and exhaust themselves to such an extent that occasionally in the fall they can become a target for grizzly bears. But even then, it's very rare for a grizzly to be successful at going after a bull elk. It was really exciting to see this once in a lifetime opportunity of a large grizzly who was successful where so many bears before him often fail. How amazing is that grizzly bear? So while lots of guides were able to get us some great views for our guests, Sarah Ernst gave us that video this week from Yellowstone National Park. Lots of activity with bears are, are going on right now as grizzly bears are entering into or fully into hyperphagia where they're up 24 hours a day stuffing their faces with food in preparation for hibernation. Let's check in with Sarah, the same guide who got you that footage of 791 to talk a little bit about black bears who peak in their viewing in the fall. Hello there, this is Sarah from EcoTours and this last week, we've really seen the black bears start to come out, mainly feeding on the berries. Now that the service berries are starting to wind down, we're seeing the hawthorns and the choke cherries and the snow bear, uh, snowberries, the rose hips come out, and our sightings of black bears has increased dramatically over the last week. Black bears are a North American original. Grizzly bears are a variety of Ursus arctis, the same bear that you get, the brown bear that you get in Europe and Asia. But black bears are a bear that evolved here uh, in North America. One major difference between the two is the short curved claws of the black bear that allow black bears to easily scale trees about as fast as a raccoon can. Uh, grizzlies with their long claws, two to six inches long, uh, find it very difficult, though not impossible, to climb trees. Typically, when we see a dark colored grizzly, a lot of folks will call that a big black bear. And when people see a brown colored black bear, they'll call it a grizzly. Uh, 
grizzlies come in a very dark brown, a black, and sometimes the lighting can make a bear look darker than it actually is. Uh, black bears in this ecosystem, about 50% of our black bears have brown fur. So you can't use the color to tell one species of bear apart from another out here. You want to look instead at the shape of the body. A black bear is going to have a smaller head with big ears and a nose that comes straight out from the face. A grizzly will have a big old round head with small ears a big hump where their shoulder muscles attach. Now black bears will have a hump too, but it's going to be small. That's just their shoulder mass. And black bears, of course, do have shoulders, but they're going to look significantly bigger on a grizzly bear. A grizzly typically has a bit of a dip down its back, and then the rump is about the same height as the shoulders, although this time of year as they're entering hyperphagia and fattening up, uh, both species of bears can look pretty round. So look for the long claws, the uh, round head and uh, big shoulder mass on a grizzly bear, and then the smaller head and the short claws on a black bear. Grizzlies are a relatively recent arrival to North America, along with their close cousin, the polar bear. But black bears have been here a lot longer. Black bears split off from the Asiatic black bear around 4 million years ago and have been in North America ever since. When they started to colonize North America, there were no grizzly bears around, but there was another bear, perhaps even more fearsome than the grizzly, the American short-faced bear. And this was a long-legged, fast, predatory bear that felt more home in open areas. Perhaps one of the reasons why black bears kept their ability to rapidly climb trees was to escape the predatory short-faced bear. And today, in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, they still use their tree climbing ability to escape uh, grizzly bears. If you look at the front claws of a black bear, they're going to be short and hooked compared to the long front claws of a grizzly bear. And you can assume that a black bear will climb a tree about as fast as a raccoon can even an adult bear. The black bear's ability to climb trees and habitat in deeply forested areas typically leads to less defensive attacks against humans than we see in grizzly bears. Grizzly bears generally prefer open habitat. In fact, their preferred habitat historically was more the Great Plains than the mountains. Grizzlies are found in mountainous areas today because it's the last place in the country where we can kind of tolerate having grizzly bears. But originally in the 17, 1800s when Lewis and Clark first came through this region, they found the greatest concentration of grizzlies in the open areas. Black bears, on the other hand, are usually found near forests. And so not only do they have the ability to climb trees to escape danger, they also live in a place where they can seek cover and get out of view much more quickly than a grizzly could. So a big thanks to Laura, Mike, and of course, Sarah Ernst for that great footage of some of our black bears in Grand Teton National Park. Lots of people come to visit us to see grizzly bears because of course, continental grizzly bears are only present in Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming of the continental United States. Black bears are present in 49 out of 50 states in the United States and are something that can be seen in Grand Teton National Park, Yellowstone National Park, or in a local wilderness area near you. So definitely, I hope that was helpful to sort of differentiate between the two species, but also got you enthused about learning more about your local black bears wherever you live. So pretty great stuff. My favorite video this week is gonna to come to us from Kelsey. Now we sometimes see Kelsey featured uh, on this program for her amazing videos about climbing in the Tetons and some of her adventurous exploits, but she's also an amazing naturalist and she had quite the sighting. Let's check it out. Hey everyone. Um, so a little while back, I got some pretty funny footage of a group of river otters messing with a juvenile bald eagle. It's a group of five river otters. When otters are found in a group, it is typically the female and her offspring. So this is likely a mom and her four pups. Uh, and they're having a really fun time teasing this, uh, this bald eagle, getting, getting pretty close to it, backing away. Now this juvenile bald eagle is probably still learning a bit about how to fish and is just hanging out, waiting to snatch a fish off of one of these, these otters. 
And I want to share a couple of fun little tidbits about river otters with y'all. Um, they are year-round residents here in Grand Teton. They spend their winters here right alongside their summers. Um, and actually in the winters, you can catch them sliding on the snow. And if they're efficient enough at their snow sliding, they can actually travel uh, on land up to about 17 miles per hour. Now in the water, they are, uh, they're they're much more graceful. And as swimmers, they can swim up to about seven miles an hour. They can hold their breath for up to four minutes at a time, and they can dive down underwater up to 65 feet. Now river otters are uh, primarily fish eaters, and you'll see in this video that one otter does catch a fish, but it doesn't get to hold on to it for super long because the, uh, the juvenile bald eagle does eventually exact its revenge and for, for, for all that teasing from the otters and manages to snatch that fish away from the otters. Although he, all, he does come pretty close to losing it, drops it. Um, and you can see in the video that the otters do get pretty annoyed at him for it. They're, they're a little cranky. Um, and uh, it, I just found that this was a pretty hilarious sighting that we all really, really enjoyed. Otters are not uh, super common to see in Grand Teton National Park, in the shores of the Snake River out there, which is where we did see these guys, and it was a real treat that day. I do love those river otters. Now, I do not see them every trip. In fact, if my guests who were with me on Monday are watching tonight, I have to tell you, it's pretty funny. I was at just the same area that Kelsey was when she saw those river otters. I saw splashing in the water. I got so excited, threw my binoculars on there, and it was a bunch of common mergansers who are very, very cool birds but I was so excited for a moment. I have not ever seen river otters teasing other species like that, but it is something that all intelligent mammals are capable of doing and do do on occasion. One of my favorite species in the Great Yellowstone ecosystem to tease other animals are ravens who love, among other things, to tease grizzly bears. They'll go and grab hair right out of their tail or their head while they're sleeping and yank it out of their head and fly away while the other ravens actually cackle and laugh. So teasing animals is um, something that you have to have some level of higher order, order cognitive thinking to be able to do. It's a sign of intelligence. River otters are a surprisingly intelligent animal despite being a weasel. So pretty amazing stuff there. Really, really fun. All right. We've had all women tonight talking to you about all these various exploits we've had. Let's tune in with eco tour uh, naturalist owner and guide Taylor to tell us a little bit about the bison breeding season which is just finishing up in Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Park. Hello everyone, Taylor Phillips here, owner of Jackson Hole Eco Tour Adventures and I'm super excited to be here with you today to show you this incredible bison footage and to share some information um, about, about bison. So starting with some history, it's, it's amazing to think that there was 40 to 60 million bison on the North American continent, stretching from the Appalachians all the way um, to the kind of California, Nevada border and to the south, ranging into northern New Mexico and into Canada. 40 to 60 million. And the, the great slaughter occurred and started in the 1800s where those 40 to 60 million were slaughtered for their hides, for their meat, for tongues, and unfortunately as a way to undermine the Native American Indians. Um, early um, North American settlers, they knew, and the government knew that the natives relied heavily on the plains bison or buffalo for, for food, for tools, for shelter. They used most every part of that animal um, for their, their existence. There were government campaigns to eliminate the bison with the distribution of ammunition. There were two small herds of bison left in North America. A small wild population in the Pelican Valley of Yellowstone National Park and then a small population of bison in, in British Columbia, um, Canada. Currently, there's about 1% um, of the historical numbers remaining today in North America. And most of those bison are on, uh, on farms, 
um, for, for food. Bison are, are herbivores and, and ruminants. They do have a four-chambered stomach and they do rely on different species of bacteria, fungus, protozoa to break down the cell walls of, of the plants that they're ingesting. Um, then once they are able to break down those cell walls, then their body is able to absorb the, the organelles inside those, those plant cell walls. Um, bison, they're constantly moving locations across the landscape. Um, they, they tend not to overgraze one particular area. Um, so they'll graze in an area and then they're constantly on the move. And it really helps promote um, different species of vegetation to, to grow in an area. Uh, as you can see in some of these videos, um, bison have a large spinal process. So that is, that's the, the bone that comes off of the top of their, their vertebrae, and there's just incredible muscle mass attached to that spinal process um, that enables them to kind of swing their head side by side, and, and they really use that head as a snowplow moving that snow off to the side during the winter months so they can access the grass underneath the snow. The rut. We're just finishing up the rut here in Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Parks. The rut also known as the breeding season. So um, August into early September and it's, it's really amazing to, to watch. So throughout the year um, male bison um, kind of form bachelor herds um, with most the most dominant males typically kind of off on their own, whereas the females form herds with, um, with their young. Uh, so you'll have herds of, you know, a couple hundred animals that actually come together during the breeding season. And male bison, what they do is they are, or I should say the most dominant male bison are, are moving through these herds and they're trying to figure out who is the closest to coming into estrus. And when they find that female that's closest to coming into estrus, you know, he is gonna tend her. He is gonna, um, he is gonna be by her side, trying to keep her away from other males in the herd. Um, he will, he'll smell and taste the urine of that female and, and lip curl or phlegm. Um, and what that does is, you know, he'll, he'll take his top lip and kind of kind of curl it upward. Um, and what that does is it helps send um, kind of the hormones in her urine to a, a special sensory organ in the roof of his mouth called the Jacobson organ. Um, and then that, that super sensitive organ will let him know how close she is to coming into heat or estrus. He will, he'll tend her, um, potentially breed her before he moves on to another female. And if you are another subordinate male bison or if you're a human, stay away from that tending pair. Um, it's that male bison that's tending a female that does tend to be the most dangerous um, of all bison. So yeah, after gestation of about 260 days, um, that 30 to 50 pound kind of reddish brown calf um, gets brought into the world, um, you know, April, May in that time frame, And, you know, they may even start walking and standing and walking about five minutes to, you know, 45 minutes after birth um, where they will, uh, you know, uh, immediately nurse on mom. And, and as soon as they can walk and follow the herd, that is what they'll do. Certainly safety in numbers when it comes to bison and bison herds. So thanks Taylor very much for that great look at the bison rut. Some really cute baby bison in there and that golden sunlight was pretty amazing as well. All right, big species are pretty awesome. Biologists locally, we call them charismatic megafauna, but we deal with all creatures great and small here in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So I thought it would be fun to tune in with Wildlife Wednesday Weekly Roundup favorite Laura and see what she had to say about great blue herons and dragonflies. 
Hi, this is Laura. Recently on a tour in Grand Teton National Park, I had an interesting encounter with a great blue heron eating dragonflies. Great blue herons are a common bird that we see in Grand Teton National Park. In North America, they're a widespread species, but people are sometimes still intrigued that we do have them here because it's a species that they can relate to from back home. Usually I see great blue herons consuming things like fish or occasionally a duckling. Apparently they also eat aquatic insects, amphibians, and reptiles. But in this case, he was snacking on dragonflies in flight. Great blue herons locate their prey by sight. So they'll see something and use their beak to snatch it. They usually sit like a statue along the water's edge, in this case, at a beaver pond location. Uh, they'll try to swallow their prey whole and one of the leading causes of death for great blue herons is actually choking on their own prey. They get a little overambitious about what they want to eat. <laughs> their eyes are a little bit bigger than the size of their neck and throat. So sometimes they accidentally choke on the things that they want to eat. To me, dragonflies are a very interesting insect. They're one of the oldest living things on planet Earth today. We estimate that dragonflies are about 300 million years old. And at times they may have been up to 30 centimeters. So as large as some birds. Dragonflies hunt in mid air. <laughs> so they're equipped with a faceted eye that can see it in almost all directions around their body, about 360 degrees of view. The only place they can't see is straight on back behind them. <laughs> they hunt almost like a hovercraft. They can fly up, down, left, right, or even hover to snatch their prey, which are usually other insects. They're a, a fierce predator. They're in an order called uh, Adentata, which means the toothed one. And they do have serrated teeth for tearing off the wings of other insects, including mosquitoes. So if you're a person who hates mosquitoes like me, <laughs> we should agree that we like dragonflies. <laughs> All right, thanks to our our common guest, a guide, I'm sorry, our common watcher favorite, Laura, although she's a guide favorite and a guest favorite too. I do want to also make sure that we thank Sarah Ernst, who gave us some of the footage of dragonflies we used in that segment. And I realized I didn't fit it, thank all the naturalists who gave us all that great bison footage as well. It wasn't just Taylor. Um, it was Seth, Mike, Kelsey, and then Sarah Ernst was involved with that as well. So my... Um, I guess later of my later thank you to you guys for that great bison video. All right, so Mike had an amazing week in Yellowstone last week, and we couldn't quite get the video finished for you in time to show to you last week, but I think you guys will really enjoy seeing all the adventures that he was on. So let's check in with Mike and see the latest in Yellowstone National Park. Hello everyone, this is Mike Vanyan, reporting from the gates of Yellowstone National Park. We have had just such an incredible week with wildlife and of course, beautiful scenery. Our winter ended with our last snowfall on July 1st. And this winter started with our first snowfall on August 31st. So summer is really quite beautiful here in Yellowstone. Both days are phenomenal. And as you can see behind me, people are streaming into the park. Yellowstone receives on average about 4.2 million people a year, but only 167,000 of those come during the four or five months of winter. So just a recap of some of the things I saw, it is berry season and all the berries are ripe and the animals are just going wild trying to get ready for the winter. So there's some great footage of bears eating berries. I saw a grouse eating some berries, uh, all the other birds as well. And let's see some other highlights of my week. I saw a bunch of ravens that have all grouped together now, depending on which part of the country you live in, 
a group of ravens is called either an unpleasantry or an unkindness, as opposed to a group of crows, which is called a murder. And then of course, only two crows is attempted murder. And also they just opened the brink of the Lower Falls Trail, allowing you to go down like 600 plus feet to get right at the top of the Lower Falls, 308 feet. Now realize that this time of year, there's only about one tenth as much water flowing over that waterfall as there would have been, say, in the springtime when all of the snow is melting. This is Mike Vanyan checking in. So thanks, Mike and Sarah Ernst, for some of that footage from Yellowstone from last week, but I still think you guys would enjoy seeing that video. He is one of the funniest guides I've ever met, you guys. We do take requests. If you have heard from a couple people in the comment section as I've been reading, as we've been going along, if you plan on visiting the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem um, and you want to go on a trip with us, you're definitely allowed to request a guide. In fact, it's a nice compliment to that guide. So if you want to deal with jokes your entire time, definitely like great puns and like dad jokes. Uh, he might be an option, option for you guys. Really, really funny guy. And I really think this next video is going to be pretty interesting. Um, we're showing this to you guys and we think it's really important to emphasize this, not because we want to encourage this behavior, but far from it. Um, Maddie, Matt Dehan, who's actually uh, the naturalist who's manning the comments section tonight, so make sure you say hi to Maddie in the comments, brings us this video from his own backyard about some of the hazards that some of our fall rutting and antlered animals face in the fall in urban and just suburban neighborhood environments. So let's check in with that. Howdy folks, this is Maddie with Jackson Hole Eco Tour Adventures doing a little hammock PSA. Especially in the fall, take your hammocks down when you're not using them. I have uh, got carabiners on mine, so a quick release. Even if you're going inside just to make a quick sandwich or something like that, do the elk, deer, moose a favor and take down your hammock so they don't get tangled up. You can do a quick search on the internet and you'll see plenty of examples. Uh, law enforcement have been called in and tased moose to free them up from the entanglements of a hammock. So learn by my example, please, and remove your hammocks when not in use, and uh, you'll save everybody a uh, certain amount of hassle, if not real danger. Um, and that is my hammock PSA. I don't think I've ever done a hammock PSA before. I know I haven't. So get yourself some carabiners. I find that to be the quick release method and uh, happy hammocking. So a big thanks to Maddie for that public service uh, announcement, I suppose is the best way to put it. It's pretty common here in the fall for elk, deer, moose, and other animals in their breeding season to be so obsessed with each other. They're not thinking about um, things in your lawn, furniture, hammocks. It's really important that we keep things like hummingbird feeders and bird feeders away from black bears this time of year. Um, the term around here is, boy, a fed bear is a dead bear. A moose who's got to be tasered to get out of a hammock would be a really bad situation. Obviously, this worked out just fine. That moose is doing well. It lives actually in Maddie's neighborhood, and he reports uh, that he and the cow uh, that he's been courting are both doing fine. Unfortunately, that cow has a calf, which means she's not going to come into season that you saw in the background there. So he's probably courting her for not, which is too bad for that bull. But I guess there's always next year, right? Now, I do want to remind everybody that if you do plan on booking a trip, we want to know who's watching these broadcasts. So we're offering 10% off if you mention the Wildlife Wednesday Weekly Roundup during your booking in the next 24 hours, just because I think it's useful for us to understand um, how far this is traveling and whether it's useful um, in terms of our bookings. We're, of course, going to continue offering it as a public service to anybody and everybody, and we hope everyone in the world can tune in and fall as much in love with the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem as I am. But 10% ain't bad, right? Come visit. Come say hi. Come visit. Uh, come see Maddie. I don't think he'll show you his over 30-year-old hammock, but he might be able to show you a bear or two. That'd be pretty good, right? All right. It's time for my favorite or my second favorite part of the broadcast, which is our trivia 
uh, section. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you last week's trivia question. And if you want, go ahead and answer in the comment section. But that's not going to win you um, a $10 gift card to our EcoTour store. you got to answer this week's trivia question to answer that correctly. So first things first, uh, my question last week was, everybody knows about the Queen of Grand Teton, Grizzly Bear 399. In fact, there was a question about, that, about her uh, that I saw earlier in the comments that I'll be addressing in just a minute. Um, but I wanted to hear from everybody if you knew the name of her most famous daughter. And what is her name? And of course, this is her research number that we call her by. Grizzly bears don't call each other by a uh, common name. It's just a name that humans can sometimes use to identify one bear over another. And we use numbers so that we're not anthropomorphizing or giving human traits or characteristics to these bears. And the question last week was, who is this grizzly bear? Now, this is a picture I took a few years ago. And so... Um, She's a little bigger these days, but those yellow ear tags she wore for many years are a dead giveaway. All of Grizzly Bear 399's cubs for a while were wearing double yellow ear tags. Now they mostly wear double orange ear tags, um, but what's her most famous daughter's name? She currently has two cubs that are almost as big as she is, and we feature a lot on this broadcast. So anybody know the answer to that question? Oh, lots of, okay, we're seeing a couple good answers. Uh, Kelly, I'm sorry, it is not raspberry. Raspberry and snow are a different family group that live up in Yellowstone National Park. This is grizzly bear 610, one of the most successful offspring of grizzly bear 399. And grizzly bear 610 um, has had quite a few litters. She's 11 years old now um, of cubs, and most of those cubs have survived to adulthood. Uh, but what makes her really fascinating are sort of three things. The first is that she has a good relationship with her mother. Generally speaking, um, large adult bears don't tolerate younger bears in their territory utilizing their food resources. And 399 is rather famous for being an exception to this rule. She does tolerate her daughter 610 being in her territory quite often. Uh, and so you'll oftentimes see them in very close proximity. And a few times on this, on this uh, program, twice in fact, we've had them in the same camera shot. Um, any other grizzly interaction, that would be very, very rare. Sometimes when they're up eating army cutworm moths in the high country, they can tolerate each other relatively closely. But that would be the only other exception. So Grizzly Bear 399, really extraordinary for tolerating her daughter, letting her daughter feed on food resources nearby. Grizzly Bear 610 tends to do the same thing that she was taught by her mother as a cub and utilize those same areas, and she teaches them to her offspring. So we now have a whole host of grizzly bears that utilize those territories. She's also also what's sometimes known as a roadside sow or a female bear that's utilizing humans as a bit of a shield from male bears who will kill grizzly bear cubs by hanging out near the sides of the road where male bears don't like to go. Oftentimes uh, grizzly bear 610 and grizzly bear 399 are able to keep those cubs out of danger from male cubs. Unfortunately, of course, it does add to mortality from human causes like being hit by cars or getting into conflict with humans over things like bird feeders, as we just discussed. So positive, negative there. It's a bit of a question over whether it's an advantage or disadvantage. The studies are not very good. Some people say there's a 50% decreased mortality under the age of two for bears that are roadside bears from male bears, but there's a 50% increased rate of mortality between the ages of two and four, which is what we would call sort of the sub-adult period for grizzlies when they're teenagers and tend to get themselves in trouble because they don't hold good territories and so they end up having to take risks maybe they wouldn't have to otherwise. And so it's kind of a wash, hard to say. A lot of um, debate out there on how exactly to manage grizzlies and how to best um, deal with those situations. So great for all of you who had the right answer there. That's Grizzly Bear 610. I thought it being fall and the leaves starting to change color, I'd ask a little bit of a question about that. So this week's question is about fall. Now to win, all you have to do is answer in the comment section. And that's if you're watching this throughout the week or if you're watching live, one person will win a $10 gift card to our EcoTour store. Uh, and that store is entirely, 100% um, of the proceeds go to fund employee health insurance. Um, so during COVID, we were shut down and we didn't have an easy way to fund 
um, our guides and office staff and everyone's health insurance. So we started this store. It's got lots of really cool stuff, um, mostly made by the guides, the office staff themselves, as well as prints from Thomas Mangelson and our guide photographer, Josh Metten. Um, I've got Grand Prismatic there, if you'd like a copy of that. We've got hand-knit hats from, uh, from our naturalist Elise. We've got masks with grizzly bears and wolves and all sorts of things on them. Um, Steo wear, uh, we're sponsored, our, our clothing is sponsored by Steo, which is a local clothing company. So check that out. Maddie will go ahead and put uh, the link to our store in the comment section. But if you want to win a $10 gift card, which is definitely enough to get some owl stickers from Wolf Biology, Kira, Wolf Biologist Kira Cassidy, um, you have to answer this question correctly, which is, what is the name of this tree that turns yellow and then orange in the fall? And it's got a white bark and anywhere where any kind of disturbance happens to that bark, that bark will get a little black part of it. It's um, in the poplar family. It is not a poplar, it's in the poplar family. I'm looking for the name of this specific tree. I will take either the full name, which is two words, or I'll take just the short name, which is just one word. So if you know the answer to our comment section, comment question of, sorry, our trivia question of the week, go ahead and comment in the comments section and uh, get a chance to win there. So we're looking forward to some of that amazing fall color in the coming week. Hopefully we'll have lots of video of all the beautiful colors as they really start to change. Tree senescence is an incredibly fascinating subject in and of itself. That's fall color change. I hope you guys are able to enjoy the colors where you're from or if you're from somewhere near the equator. Uh, I hope of course that you're able to enjoy the change of seasons or gosh if you're joining us from all the way in the southern hemisphere. Um, I hope you're also able to enjoy, I guess, let's see, it's spring. It's coming into spring for you all. So wherever you are, I hope you enjoy the change of seasons. But if you're getting in the United States and you're getting those colors coming in, send us some pictures. We'd love to see what it looks like from where you are. All right, super fun. This has been a really cool week for videos, has it not? It's been really amazing. Um, but this is my favorite part. I'm here to answer your questions live. Um, I'm a wildlife biologist, I'm a naturalist, I have a pretty strong understanding of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, wildlife in general. Um, you can ask me about anything you want. You can ask me about clouds or astronomy or whatever it is. I'll see if I can get you an answer. If I don't know right away, we'll either get Maddie to cheat for me and look it up and post in the comment section, or he may just know off the top of his head. He's a pretty amazing naturalist as well. Or I promise we'll get down to the bottom of it and get you an answer. So the way this is going to work is I've got my iPad here and you'll see me kind of looking down as I look at your questions. Um, so bear with me because I'm going to sort of speed read and see if I can't get some answers. Let's see here. Susan asks, is this the bear featured in a news video taking down a bull elk in the river? Tough to watch. Susan, yes. Grizzly Bear 791 is the name of that grizzly. That's the first video that we showed this week. So if you're going, what is that? Go back to the front and when this broadcast is over and you can see this great footage. Um, I have seen, of course, the video that is going around of the bear actually hunting this elk. Um, and I've asked the owner of that video, who is a great naturalist in Yellowstone National Park, if we might have permission to use it. Um, I haven't quite heard back from him. Hopefully maybe by next week. I have a feeling that he's got a little bit of an overwhelming request. I've, I've seen that video in places like Newsweek and um, some other major broadcasters. So hopefully we'll have some footage for you. Um, maybe next week we'll see what he has to say uh, of that amazing grizzly bear hunt of that elk. But it is tough. To watch it is tough to watch so full disclosure on that thanks very much for that question let's see what we got here Jacqueline has a really interesting question um, and I, I the whole thing's not going to show up on screen so I'm going to read it all to you what are your thoughts on grizzly bear 399 last week it was said that people know where her den is so if she struggles or if she wouldn't be able to uh, nurture her cubs throughout the winter would people step up and protect them to assure that they would all survive or do you feel that nature should be allowed to take place all right Jacqueline you've opened a can of worms with that question that's great so First things first, um, I feel very strongly as a um, 
outdoor educator that it's not my job to inflict my opinion on you, right? There's lots of opinions out there. What I'd much rather do is give you the facts of the situation, allow you to think critically for yourself and come up with your own conclusions. I'm not necessarily here to persuade you one way or another, but I can give you the perspective of Grand Teton National Park and the traditional perspective of a wildlife biologist, which full disclosure, I do agree with. Um, and that is that if an animal population is is stable or it can support the choice, we don't interfere with the natural system with a few rare exceptions. So a good ex exception of when we might interfere. If an, a deer is hit by a car and it's suffering on the side of the road and it was a human caused injury but um, and it can't get up and it's having a hard time and it's not gonna make it, then of course we're gonna be supportive of putting that animal down. We're not gonna let nature take its course and let it suffer for many, many hours uh, on the side of the road, right? That wouldn't make any sense. Another good example of when we wouldn't allow nature to take its course would be if there aren't enough of an animal left for that animal, um, that species to survive. So I think it was 1955, I think I've got my facts straight. We were down to seven hooping cranes, I think it was, on the entire planet. Um, recently in New Zealand, I think they were down to six kakapo, which is a um, flightless parrot of New Zealand. Those animals are gonna require human inter intervention to sur survive and save the species. And both of those cases we actually captured all of those animals. Another good example of this is the black-footed ferret in eastern Wyoming. We, we captured all known um, members of that species and we bred them in captivity to try to get their numbers up to the point where they would be uh, able to be re-released in the wild. And the good news is all three species, black-footed ferrets, hooping cranes, and kakapo are doing better. It looks like all three are going to survive, although kakapo are definitely still on the brink. Um, and it's only because of human intervention, uh, they almost certainly would have gone extinct otherwise. So I guess the problem here is it's a matter of thinking um, what's in the best interest of the ecosystem versus thinking what's in the best interest of the individual. And there's no right or wrong answer. Thinking in the best interest of the ecosystem would suggest we have enough grizzlies, grizzly bear populations while low, while genetically questionable in terms of whether or not they should be removed from the endangered species list. Do we genetically have a stable enough population? We do have enough animals um, that another animal would be able to reproduce the species. It is not at risk of extinction if 399 were unable to raise those quadruplets. Um, so in those circumstances, Grand Teton National Park, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, because grizzlies, of course, are a threatened species on the endangered species list, so they get a say in this, would not intervene if Grizzly Bear 399 were to pass away or if her cubs were to struggle uh, because she wasn't able to, for instance, produce enough milk. Um, under those circumstances, she's an old, old bear. This is a little bit of a genetic abnormality to have so many offspring. Uh, and... That's how it goes. The good news is, after all that, I don't think we have to worry about it. I was really concerned with how thin Grizzly Bear 399 was looking earlier in the year. She looks so much better, you guys. She has really, really fattened up. And the one thing I've learned about that bear after 15 years, I think now, of spending time viewing her, watching her, uh, tracking her movements throughout the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem is A, never make assumptions about any animal. As soon as you think you've got it all dialed and you get cocky, they're gonna prove you wrong. 399 proves me wrong constantly about all sorts of things. Things we know to be true of all grizzly bears, she will prove we actually don't know what we're talking about. Um, things we feel confident about grizzly bears as a species, she will prove we don't know what we we're talking about. Don't count her out yet. Um, I have said for years because of her old age, well, this is probably our last year. We won't see her next year. I'm always wrong. And so you know what? I don't bet on that bear anymore. I don't make any guesses about what she is or is not capable of. She's a pretty amazing animal. If she's successful and is able to hibernate and bring all four of those cubs back out in the spring, that would be really, really, really unlikely. So I think everybody needs to be prepared. Grizzly bears cubs face an almost 80% mortality rate under the age of two years. And to have four cubs all survive, boy, 
that would really be, I guess the best way to put it would be unexpected. She's done it plenty of times before. Every single time she has triplets, we say, well, 80% of the cubs usually don't survive. And she brings all, trip, all three triplets out of hibernation. Um, so <laughs> I'm not making any bets anymore. I've bet wrong against this bear way too many times to have any guesses on what she is or is not capable of. But Grand Teton National Park, the US Fish and Wildlife Service are not gonna intervene under the circumstances. They're gonna let nature take its course. Um, that's part of how this all works. I think it's a great educational experience as well. Uh, we're certainly not going to allow things to suffer needlessly, uh, but we're certainly not going to intervene if it looks like all four cubs aren't going to make it. Uh, and I think it's reasonable to have an expectation, I don't mean to be Debbie Downer, that that's certainly possible. But you know what? Mark my words. She's probably going to surprise us all again. So great question. Thank you very much for that. I've really appreciated it. Let's see here. Ah, took a tour with uh, Sarah Wedner last week. Fabulous tour, our second tour with Eco Tour, and we'll go again when we're in town. Uh, Lynn, I'm, I'm highlighting this just to tell you, Sarah just showed me amazing footage she took this week. Maybe uh, it's footage while you were with her. I'm not really sure, but she's going to give that to us. Hopefully we'll have it for next week um, and you'll be able to check it out. Uh, so that should be really exciting. Thanks so much for your comments. She's a great, great naturalist. Let's see what else we have here. Do you guys have October tours? Of course we have October tours. Give us a call. Make sure you mention the 10% off. We'll take care of you for sure. Thanks for that. Let's see here. Oh my gosh, lots of correct questions in the trivia. Um, I'm very impressed particularly with Elsa who decided to give us the scientific name, Elsa. You and I will get along fine. I'm very impressed. All right, let's see here. Michael asks, was this year's first snowfall early compared to other years? Michael, we typically only have two frost-free years, uh, frost-free months every year, which is July and August, but it can technically snow or get below freezing 365 days a year up here high in the mountains. So uh, as for what's expected, well, there's two ways to think about it. There's the very scientific meteorological study kind of way. And that answer is no, that is not unexpected. Uh, if you look over a long period of time, say hundred years, it's happened quite commonly. In terms of my lifetime, I'm 38 years old. Um, I have seen that happen maybe four times. So I'd say relatively unusual from a human lifespan perspective, but not unexpected would be the best way to put it. Uh, definitely everybody was pretty concerned with all their veggies. Most people were able to cover them with plastic, save them, and they're still doing fine. So human, human impact, not so big. Wildlife, we're certainly expecting a frost any day now, so certainly wouldn't impact them either. But great question. Oh, Jan, great question. I've read that the Junction Butte Pack has several litters of pups. I thought only Alpha's bred. Would this be to increase strength of pack? So you're asking a great question. And one of the fun things about wildlife biology is we don't always have all of the answers. Um, and this is a really good example. If you were to ask me in the early 1970s, for instance, about this, based off the re research of Mac, who's a very, very important wolf biologist, my answer would be, uh, no, it wouldn't be to increase the strength of the pack, um, but it would be maybe perhaps because of a tolerant alpha. We now know, okay, maybe, but I think it's gonna be a little bit different. Wolf alpha females, we now know, put out pheromones that actually suppress heat or estrus in the other females of the pack. Um, and the more dominant the wolf is, it's suggestive that the more powerful the pheromones they release. So if you were to ask me this in the 1990s, I would say to you, that's a weak alpha that she's allowing all these other females to have offspring. But then there was a wolf in Yellowstone that really changed our mind about that. Um, I think I'm gonna get my numbers right on this, but the name of the wolf was 42F, and she was bred with 21M. She was one of the early wolves of Yellowstone National Park, and her sister, 
who was either 40 or 41, I think it was 41F, uh, was the alpha of the Druid Peak Pack for many, many years. And she was just a brutal dictator, just very dominant, constantly asking for submission displays, constantly biting the other females of the pack, just really rough. They were always limping and bleeding from her going after them. And 42 was what we used to call the Omega, the lowest of the low, the animal who all the other wolves blame when things go wrong. And what we thought was, oh, well, the Alpha is really strong and 42, the Omega is really weak. Well, long story short, we're not exactly sure what happened, but there was a signal from the collar of 41F. Her mortality signal went off. The GPS collars that some wolves wear, if they don't move for more than 24 hours, just no movement, there's a little gyroscope in the collar that'll put out a special signal that'll indicate to the research researchers that the, the subject is likely dead. They went to go investigate and they couldn't even find her. She was in pieces. She had been torn to pieces by the other females of the pack. And her sister, who had been beat upon by her, um, her alpha sibling, um, had led an attack, we think, uh, on the alpha. And so it became very clear that the reason that 42 was the omega, so to speak, was not because she was the weakest wolf in the pack, but was in fact the second strongest or ha perhaps the strongest. And the reason she was so picked on by her sister, the Alpha, was not because she was weak, but because the Alpha felt threatened by her and so made a special point to try to put her in her place all the time, which was mimicked by the other wolves. Long story short, 42 becomes the Alpha. The Omega suddenly becomes the Alpha, which completely rearranges our understanding of what the heck an Omega is. And she is very, very tolerant of other females in the pack having pups. And that's most likely because her sister had gone into the den whenever 42 had become pregnant, had pups, and killed her pups. And so a, a lifetime of losing litter after litter to her sister probably meant that when she was alpha, she wasn't going to do the same thing to the other females of the pack. As a result of that decision, that pack became huge. At one point, there were 27 wolves in the Lamar Valley with the Druid Peak Pack. And there was a schism. They did split into smaller packs. That's a little unsustainable for pack size. And Junction Butte is getting to be a little unsustainable for pack size. And so I would expect a schism sometime soon. But our understanding of why females that are not the alpha breed versus don't breed has become quite muddied by all of these experiences. Is it because the alpha is not putting out that pheromone and is weak? Or is it because that alpha is tolerating other wolves having pups to grow the pack in size? Or is there no intention involved? It's just a personal decision by the alpha on whether or not she's going to tolerate pups. It's hard to say. It's hard to know and hard to think into the mind of a wolf. So um, I really appreciate your question. I think it's a great, great question. Um, and uh, I'm sorry I don't have a great answer for you, for sure. Um, but... But uh, really fascinating stuff. Maybe in another 10 years, we'll have another amazing wolf out of the Junction Butte pack, for instance, that will tell us a little bit more. So thank you very much for that. That's a great question. Oh, Susan's asking for otter note cards in the store. Susan, let's make it happen. I'm going to see what I can do. I'm going to talk to Josh, who makes our note cards for the store, and see if I can't talk you into some river otters. Let's do it. see here. All right. I think, 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 think we've got all the questions for this week. So guys, it's been such a pleasure uh, spending this Wednesday with you all. I want to give a big thanks to the Travel and Tourism Board who actually gave us a grant um, to do these Wildlife Wednesday programs and are helping to fund this. They want to remind everybody who's planning on G Jackson, uh, visiting Jackson Hole to be clean, careful, and connected to check for up-to-date info at jhcovid.com. Make sure you're washing your hands. Face masks are required in Teton County. Uh, they also want to make sure, of course, everybody's acting ethically towards wildlife, maintaining an appropriate distance. So a big thanks to the Travel and Tourism Board. I hope you all have a fantastic week. Have a wild weekend. Stay safe and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.